Number seven ministries. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news. Welcome everyone to Number Seven Ministries Christian Outreach. Today's sermon is called Stealing the Burdens from Jesus. We will be like God when we stop trying to be God. In other words, we will be more like Jesus when we stop trying to do the jobs that Jesus has to do. Let Jesus do his job and then we will actually become like him. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. You have uh, individuals who uh, meddle. A meddler is someone who gets involved with other people's business that they have no business doing in the first place. You know, there are uh, personal things that goes on in people's life that God just doesn't want you to even touch. Um, I believe that we have enough problems within our own life to deal with nine times out of ten that we don't need to uh, uh, meddle with other people's uh, business unless God is really leading us and guiding us to do it. And if he's leading us and guiding us to do it, then it will bless and there will be productive results from it. The person who you're uh, dealing with that God led you to deal with, you will actually give them a sense of encouragement. You will give them a sense of direction, a sense of healing because God's words will flow through you. And it will be evident to the person and to yourself. So we don't want to suffer from our own wrongdoing. But the Bible says if you do suffer, let it be because you're a Christian and let it be a suffering because you're following uh, the Spirit of God and let it be uh, to glorify God. So with this being said, in this life, we are going to suffer no matter what. We're either going to suffer for serving God or we're going to suffer for serving Satan. So we might as well go ahead and suffer for serving God. But knowing that you're going to suffer no matter who you serve, why take on unnecessary sufferings for the devil? Why take on unnecessary sufferings for committing sin when we're going to suffer for Christ? We, don't, we shouldn't do that. One of the things that I've learned from personal experience is this, is that when we sin and when we suffer for the devil, the devil loves it and the sin that we do actually self perpetuates itself. And I'm going to explain that. You start off uh, with one sin, whether you uh, sin by word, by thought, by deed, by premeditation, by action. Somewhere down the line, we sin. After we sin, we get guilt. We get condemnation. We get some form of consequence for that sin. And then after we feel the suffering from that, we try to self-medicate ourselves and take away that guilt and take away that pain by sitting, sinning again. And then after we sin again, we get more guilt, more condemnation, more consequences, and then we try to cure it again by sinning again to take away the pain because sin has pleasure for a season. And by doing this, we actually become slaves for the kingdom of the devil, for the kingdom of hell, for the kingdom of Satan. We become slaves and we become bound. And there are so many people in this life who are stuck in that self-perpetuation of sin and pain and guilt and consequence. And it just goes on and on and on. And it really, truly takes an act of God to pull someone out of that. I remember doing that. I remember doing heinous things in my past and the, 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 the guilt that came from it. My, my own conscience would torment me and then I would try to cure myself by sinning again. It, it seems like ridiculous, but it's something that happens. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3 
and 4. And the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. Uh, for nothing for on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of man went to their daughters of men and had children by them. They were Okay, now for those of you who are not familiar with this uh, particular scripture or scriptures, uh, the, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, the uh, Nephilim, Nephilim or Nephilim or potato, potato, however you want to pronounce it, uh, that is just another word or name or title for giants. In King James Version, it says that they were giants, uh, like Goliath. And in this version right here, it says uh, Nephilim, which is another word for giant. Now, one of the things that I want to make out, some people, are you guys aware of this? Are you guys, you guys have seen, uh, these are actually uh, real uh, pictures of the bones that they've discovered from these giants. This is a, a gentleman right here, and you can see the head is probably about the size of that guy right here. Uh, behind me, this is uh, currently uh, just a tall gentleman. And then right here is um, the real axes or spears or um, the size that they would have been for like Goliath and the giants that this is talking about. And then this right here is another picture, uh, archaeological finding of the bones, and they have pictures of it. But there's just masses of information about these bones that they've discovered. Um, and the Bible talks about giants. Lord saw how great men's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil all the time. The Lord was pleased that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. Okay, now uh, this is a powerful saying. It's saying that the Lord uh, regretted making man because his heart was constantly evil, and. Uh, the wickedness was, uh, it, it, creation started to corrupt itself. And one of the ways that that happened, I'm going to backtrack, is because these giants, um, in this Bible verse, it's saying that these uh, Nephilim, which is actually uh, the fallen angels, the fallen angels, uh, like the devil and one-third of the angels, when they came down, they fornicated or committed adultery. They slept with the women in the days back then. And what they produced was a freak of nature, and that's where these uh, Nephilim came from. They were giants that were being produced. They had six fingers, six toes. They were uh, an abomination. This wasn't supposed to happen. God has a proper order for a man and woman and for marriage and the, uh, the holiness of the marriage to preserve it, not to step out and do things. And we have to remember, too, that maybe literally uh, angels are not coming down and sleeping with the women. But you have to realize when you are not under the protection of a marriage covenant, that indirectly you're doing the same thing. You're committing sins with people not outside of the marriage, and you're networking with demons. And because of it, there's going to be all types of unnecessary burdens that we as uh, humans are taking on that God never wanted us to have in the first place. And the Bible says that it grieved God. Just, just meditate on that for a moment. It, God regretted that he created man in the first place. Uh, not because of man was so wicked uh, outside of this event, but be, this event triggered God wanting to destroy mankind because man started uh, having sex with demons and creating freaks of nature. It's like that one movie that's out there, Splice. They started uh, messing with DNA, and they started messing with genetics, and it started breeding uh, evil, wicked, ungodly things. 
like the stem cell research can be good in some aspects, but in other aspects, if they take it too far and they start cloning humans and start mixing uh, cells with animals and uh, combining uh, the genetics from a human to the genetics of a cat and just playing around, you know, that's, that's trying to be God. I said, if we stop trying to be God, let God be God, we'll actually become like God if we stop trying to be like Him. If we stop trying to do His job, if we stop trying to judge other people, if we stop trying to control everything. Do you see what I'm saying, trying to be like God? Let God do what He... God will control everything. Us as Christians, we have to, we have to take on the challenge of self-control. And by the time we're done with that, I promise you, we will be exhausted. That if you are uh, representing yourself, the world will say, if you represent yourself, then you have a fool for a client. But I'm going to tell you in the spiritual realm, it's the same way. If you're representing yourself, then you have a fool for a client. And I also learned this, that if you do have a lawyer, whether it be a court-appointed lawyer or a paid lawyer, if you have a lawyer representing you, I found out that they will register with the clerk of courts and they will register to be able to file motions on your behalf. And once you have a lawyer representing you, you can no longer file your own motions. In other words, if you paid for an attorney and his job is to file the motions for you and you go behind his back and you start filing your own motions because you don't trust him anymore, the court will no longer accept your motions because you've agreed to hire or accept this lawyer to represent you. I'm going to ask as Christians, do we do the same thing? Do we proclaim that we have Jesus Christ as our own lawyer, but then we go behind his back and we try to file our own motions? Because I'm going to tell you that if we're Christians, we cannot file our own motions because the Father in heaven will say, I don't see my son rejected. I'm only looking for my son. Nothing else. Are you so legalistic and so uh, dependent on your schedule that you block God from being able to reroute your plans? That's what Jesus Christ is saying. Take no thought for tomorrow. For today there's enough drama. And be open in your schedule on a daily basis for God to reroute you. And by doing that, by not taking on the burden of having to have your whole entire next five years of your life being planned out, by not worrying about that, you're going to give back the burden that Jesus wants. The chastisement of our peace is upon him, and with his stripes, Okay, now that's a mouthful. One of the things it's saying that um, Jesus uh, took our burdens. Indirectly, that's what it said. It said he took on our infirmities. He carried our sorrows. And then it says after that, more or less, man misunderstood him. Man thought that because he was doing those things, God rejected him or God hated him. How many of us feel that un unless you're rich, unless everything's going great, unless you have a wonderful title, then God doesn't love you or you're not favored, you're not blessed? That's not in the Bible. Read the Bible and see all the stories of those who suffered for Christ's sake. But the beautiful thing about this is that when we suffer for Christ's sake. Remember in the beginning of the message I said about the sin, committing sin, causes us to feel guilty and shameful and take on burdens that we're not supposed to and try to heal ourselves and perpetuate the sin by curing our guilt from the sin by committing more sin. But I'm going to tell you the opposite is true. That if we suffer for Christ's sakes in our suffering, it will perpetuate a growth and a spiritual maturity that as we suffer, we become more dependent on Him. And then when we become more dependent on him we obey him more then we obey him more we suffer more and then when we suffer more we depend on him more there's a self-perpetuation going on